Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here, and I love this love this conference. One of the few I go to each year, but uh, fantastic yeah, ideas abound. Uh, I w I've been working uh, for probably nearly two decades with interorbital systems. The company I co-founded with uh, my husband Roderick, and we are dedicated to making uh, low cost, actually the lowest cost in the world, orbital and interplanetary uh, vehicles. We work uh, at the Mojave Air and Space Port uh, with our manufacturing facilities and prototyping facilities there. And we do our test launches uh, at the uh, Mojave test area north uh, of the town of Mojave near Cone Dry Lake. One of the few places in the country, in the world actually, where you can do a private commercial launch. Uh, make every bit of hardware in-house, including the engines, guidance systems, uh, everything from the ground up, including the satellite kits uh, with our own form factor for the TubeSat and uh, the more conventional CubeSats. Uh, the core uh, vehicle of our program and the basic building block of every one of our modular launch vehicles is called the Common Propulsion Module or CPM. Uh, here's a picture of it on its mobile launcher. Uh, this is also a standalone sounding rocket. Uh, we'll be doing a space altitude launch with this sometime in the first quarter getting our licensing for that now. Uh, it's 310 kilometers. Uh, it'll take 145 kilos uh, in, under full power. So this will be a test flight for us as well, but it's also a launch opportunity. And we'll be testing everything we'll need uh, to do our orbital launches, which will follow on sometime in mid-2015. Uh, here's uh, some images of our uh, most recent test launch actually the first launch of this, uh, this vehicle. Uh, we have um, our, our payload uh, uh, sections are being closed off just before launch, so our, our customers, and there are four uh, customers on this, um, on this rocket, so it was our first commercial launch also, in addition to being the maiden launch of the vehicle. Uh, so we give people as much battery power as possible, give it the longest lifespan, and uh, this uh, this vehicle is, uh, as you can see, it's about 30 feet in length, uh, a little bit over two feet in diameter, and uh, a very, very sturdy vehicle. But it is, as I said, the basic building block. If we cluster these together to meet various mission requirements, uh, we can get uh, all sorts of capabilities, including lunar capabilities. Uh, this launch of the vehicle with our uh, a kind of classic uh, propulsion system there running on turpentine and nitric acid, which are our propellants of choice. Uh, no babysitting with cryogenics. Load it and uh, just open the valves and you have fire. Uh, shot from the rocket itself. GoPro cameras are fantastically rock solid. That's what we used here. And uh, it's a little bit of rocket TV for you. If you go to our website at interorbital.com, uh, there's, there's video for all these tests and, and uh, launches. Just a note, in the program, it has the wrong uh, email address for me. It's not LOS, but IOS at interorbital.com. And you can reach me through the website also. Uh, so that uh, launch, as I mentioned, was the beginning of our uh, commercial operations. The payloads were uh, diverse uh, from uh, National Cheng Kung University uh, and uh, a Brazilian-American uh, um, combination there of MTM to Sky and Boreal Space, who were local here. Uh, Google Lunar X Prize team Synergy Moon, and uh, most notorious John Frisch Frischante from the Red Hot Chili Peppers uh, uh, Enclosure album, which uh, uh, was a center of a worldwide uh, advertising campaign, and uh, which incidentally won several Golden Lions at the, the Cannes Advertising Awards this year. So it was pretty cool to be involved in that, and uh, it was a primarily a hardware test. We uh, tested the propulsion system in flight, a unique cable launch device that I can tell you more about if you like later. Uh, gave us a virtual 180-foot rail. Uh, it also demonstrated uh, a staging device that we'll be using on our uh, orbital vehicles. And we had the FAA AST there to witness that technology demonstration. And this rocket went to Mach 1.5, gave about uh, 6 Gs to the payloads. Everybody was happy with that because all those payloads came back intact and alive, as did the vehicle, and it's being ready for reuse. Um, the common propulsion module scales up in a cluster, as you can see, that uh, 
the central uh, circle there is, the, is actually the second stage. The surrounding four modules provide the boost phase, and then there's a uh, satellite module, which is the third stage that, ha stage that has an additional kick motor on that. So the uh, three-stage vehicle uh, uses parallel and tandem staging. Uh, it is a small vehicle. It'll fit in a cargo container for transport, and it'll carry roughly 30 kilograms of any form factor. Uh, but we uh, tend to go towards the CubeSats and CubeSats for our main payloads. That'll take between a 1 and a 4 uh, U at this point. Uh, our unique rocket technologies include this, this modular combination, which is a, a descendant of the OTROG uh, uh, original concept uh, proposed and executed by Lutz Kaiser during the 1970s, the, the world's first commercial uh, launch company. Uh, we uh, have uh, environmentally safe, storable, high-density propellants. They give us wonderful uh, ISP and uh, very, very low cost. And these are also an alternative to the toxic uh, hydrazine and uh, uh, actually UDMH, UDMH and um, nitrogen tetroxide. So, uh, and these are commonly available industrial um, chemicals. So, pennies rather than hundreds of dollars per pound. Uh, we use blowdown propellant feeds so we don't have to deal with a, the expense of a failure prone system like a turbo pump and uh, unique rocket injectors and other in-house developments. And to keep the cost really low, we use an ocean launch as our, our main type of, uh, of lofting mechanism. Many advantages to that. We uh, do our first launches out of the ocean off the coast of Southern California. And uh, we, through this system, can make launch on demand possible. Uh, we have less restrictions than we would uh, in terms of scheduling and other costs, uh, it, it, uh, rather than going out of, a, let's say, a federal spaceport. So there's no limit on the size of the vehicle for this uh, type of launch. Rapid response, again, and the most cost-effective and rapid sort of launch we can, we can muster. Uh, the rocket's towed out in its container, which is also a spaceport. Uh, we get a launch license for a certain latitude and longitude, which means we can go to any location to give any inclination that the customer might want. There's a ballast unit that steadies the rocket, and the rocket is raised and launched from the uh, canister, about the most Spartan system you can find. We're looking, again, at various ocean bases. And for uh, equatorial launches, uh, we will very likely use a big island of Hawaii as our uh, base of operations and do our Google Lunar X Prize flight with our team Synergy Moon uh, from the ocean near Hawaii. Uh, for those of you interested in lunar uh, operations and experimentation, uh, the vehicle uses a lunar transfer stage, in this case carrying a, uh, a rendering of what is a notional look at our um, a lunar lander, which is now under construction and will be tested shortly. Uh, that'll carry Synergy Moon's payload, and we're dealing with another three other Google Lunar X Prize teams at the moment. Uh, and what is probably most interesting to this audience would be the lunar sample return missions, uh, which would be a uh, collection of a variety of, of um, dust and rocks on the lunar surface and rocketing that back to Earth with the central core of, the, of that, that lander. Uh, our estimated uh, uh, capacity there is 120 pounds to, to, uh, circumlunar, uh, to the circumlunar area. We have uh, lunar orbit, 80 pounds. Uh, soft landing of 40 pounds. Uh, we can include the lander, it's 164 pounds. And a sample return of 5 pounds. Uh, we also provide um, satellite kits. And this is important for many reasons. Uh, most people cannot afford secondary ride-alongs. We couple these kits with a launch, and if you're an academic group for as little as $8,000, you can have a TubeSat kit and a launch. And right now there are 92 of these payloads out in the world. Uh, at 20 locations, they're serving as the center of curricula. So uh, uh, 
uh, very exciting for us and um, a huge amount of space science that wouldn't normally be done unless our program existed. Here are some of the payloads, as you can see, and if you can't read the little tiny ants on bricks up there, you can check the launch manifest at interorbital.com and we update that regularly, but we have a, an international array of, and uh, also a use array of um, uh, anything from arts to military to uh, hard science uh, to advertising, really anything. So these are the CubeSats on board, and those are the TubeSats at the moment. <coughs> this, is, um, this is spread over three sold-out launches. Currently, we're working on filling the manifest of the fourth. Uh, and so, as you can see, it is, it is a, a hugely diverse group of people uh, from, I think it's uh, 17 different countries at the moment, and the U.S., so uh, uh, very intriguing use of, um, of those small spaces. Uh, this is our lunar sample return mission, which is, uh, uh, it's actually, I guess aspect ratio is a little weird there, but that is actually the outside, which is more like the stardust capsule, which we're using. This is going to be used first to cook ramen with the heat of reentry. Uh, this is a, an advertising project we're doing for Nissan, and uh, actually a lot of science involved in this too. But it's, you know, it pays for our program, so uh, we're very happy with it, and uh, it, it's an exciting uh, uh, set of um, uh, little episodes that go with that. These are the upcoming missions that we have: many, uh, uh, many test flights, many unusual uh, applications. Again. Uh, Space diving with Olaf Zipser, who'll ride a modified uh, CPM for his first launches. He's intending to create a, an orbital return suit, so eventually these, these will be five progressively higher launches uh, for Olaf. And um, the other missions that we have, which are our satellite missions, the Google Lunar X Prize mission, Lunar Sample Return mission, and eventually uh, orbital tourism. We're looking at that. So uh, I thank you very much. and. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. This paper is now open for questions. Who has a question? If no one else does, I have a question. So um, could, could you talk a little bit about what kind of support, about your support staff and what kind of support they provide for people who want to be, you want to ride along, go, go for the ride? Uh, they, we will work with any group who has a system that may not be able to fly on another type of rocket. We will work with people who have propulsion systems that they want to test because they are the dedicated, this is a dedicated launcher for primary payloads. All those uh, satellites you saw were primary payloads. They we're not protecting a big, uh, you know, billion dollar uh, Uh, that'll be done at sea for most of this, and uh, for the test flights, we're going out of a very likely black rock. Uh, so it'll be easier to, you know, to find the, uh, the capsule. Uh, for the, um, the actual space launches, this will very likely be ocean recovery. I have a question. Uh, is Eric over here? Um, let's see. Uh, for your, are you uh, planning a series of suborbital flights, or are you moving straight into orbital uh, we actually have an orbital uh, guided flight coming up uh, somewhere around December. Mm -hmm. uh, that first uh, first flight was unguided except for the, um, uh, the a cable launch device that did some preliminary guidance. But our actual guidance system is being tested first. We're doing software tests on a quadcopter, and we have a lunar lander which will fly that same software uh, with the thrusters, and that'll be then applied to uh, the rocket the rocket that was returned from that last uh, last flight. Uh, then we have the uh, 
high altitude launch that I mentioned before, the 310 kilometer apogee launch. So that'll be uh, another test. So that's, that's the primary test that we'll do before the orbital flight to make sure that all telemetry is functioning and the deployment units are working at altitude. Yeah, I was just wondering about uh, if you have payload space on the suborbital test. Uh, we do. That, yeah. uh, and you're, are you expecting recover from the 300 uh, kilometer? Uh, potentially. We're, yeah. we're going to try it, yes. So we'll see. Uh, that's no guarantee, but we will try. <laughs> Hi, Chris Craddock, Rocket Star. Uh, I'm sure you mentioned this before, and I may have just not caught it. Uh, but for the orbital flights, how many stages are you planning to use on it's the? It's a three-stage uh, vehicle. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, have, how you're going to do all of your orbital launches from the oceans? Uh, at this point, uh, yes, but we are talking with a neighboring country about a new spaceport okay. that uh, we may be flying from as early as next year. So we're working through permissions now for that. Okay. Have you built any of the hardware associated with a, a sea launch? Yes, test, test pieces, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's been a huge amount of work done in, uh, in the uh, 60s. Uh, CLAR project, uh, many, many th uh, through the uh, Naval Research Lab. So it's uh, it's a very, very good, very stable system that we're, we're using, and our tests have proven that, that it looks good for us. That's what we're going with it. Plus, it's incredibly low cost. Dan. This is Dan from Tricep. Um, have you guys gotten any um, pushback from the State Department for, like, ITAR and uh, uh, well, we, with all foreign our, militaries? And all our small sats, if they're going to another country, have to be licensed. So we work with the State Department on that. and to. I think we've sent out probably 40 under license. Uh, there's always pushback for what they call our ICBMs, <laughs> moving those around. Uh, you know, but I see it as dual use, and I'm looking at the positive, you know, positive use of them. You know, not as weapons, but as uh, space tourism, satellite launchers, you know, all the good things. So. Where are you doing your suborbital launch from? Uh, that um, first one, first one is a low altitude launch. The guided launch will be out of the Mojave Test Area near the Pacific Rocket Society site, and and uh, the uh, that's near Kundry Lake, so 30 miles north of Mojave. Uh, the second one will either be out of Black Rock or from the ocean. Okay, and approximately when? That's approximately in the first quarter. It's a late first quarter for the space altitude launch. And you have space on those four cubes? Yeah, we do. We have we have uh, ten kilograms of space left on that uh, on that uh, space altitude launch. What about the second one? On the I'm I'm, talking, I'm actually talking about the second one. That's the one we have space on. Uh, the first one sold out. The, our guided launch has payloads already. But the um, uh, so when space altitude launch, that's the one that's February, March, something like that. That's a, the 310 kilometer apogee. Probably 12 minutes of microgravity on that. Uh -huh. uh, that's, uh, that has spaces remaining. I'd be happy to talk with you about that if you like. This is Dan. Um, what's your altitude for your second launch then? So the second, the second launch is uh, 10,000 to 20,000 feet. We're limited at that, um, uh, that Mojave test area. It's a shared airspace with Edwards and China Lake. And so I think the maximum we can go to is 50,000. Uh, we're just looking to do some systems performance. So we're not really going for altitude. We put a small amount of propellant in the rocket. It's difficult to hold it back, so we want to keep it, we want to keep it reasonable and not exceed the altitude limits which is harder than you might think. So. Tracy, I was raised as a, that question. These, these things are, are kind of like solids and you like them and go and you're done? They're, they're as close to a solid as you can get, but they're a liquid, so you don't get that, uh, you know, that tremendous bang on the takeoff. You know, we had a, like a, we're looking at a 3 to 5G takeoff load on that. So if you have delicate instrumentation or something that can't uh, take uh, uh, like, uh, like a solid would put out the, the, the bad exhaust products, you know, that might damage delicate uh, maybe optical equipment, uh, 
these are very clean burning propellants, and uh, so I think that would be a you know an advantage. The soft ride, the clean burning propellants, all those things. Uh, this is Ryan from Planetary Systems. Do, do you intend on having the ability to uh, be able to cut off and then restart these engines for multiple deployments in uh, yes, orbits? Yes, we have uh, we have the complete uh, throttle ability and on-off capability on these engines. We we spent over a decade creating this uh, this type of engine, and it's completely reliable. We've had many many test firings qualifications, and this was uh, this actually the second. Uh, what was the first launch of the CPM, the full-scale CPM, was uh, the second in a series of uh, test launches that have flown with that engine. That engine is the core engine for all the modules. So our propulsion system is complete. It's ready. It's a matter of uh, grouping the, uh, the modules together and then uh, you know, going for that. Any Thank other you. questions? Anything from the peanut gallery in cyberspace, you guys, Steve? Over to you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll introduce uh, the next, next one. Year. The next one is Francois Martel. Yes. Next speaker. Yes, Francois, is this Francois? Yes, Francois Martel, Massachusetts Institute of Technology with applications of ion electrospray microthruster technology for nanoset missions to the moon and beyond.